Boxing fans, the sweet science is known for its producing of icons that have transcended the sport in a major way, casting a shadow over their peers, the sport, and their respective eras as a whole. Today's focus is the heavyweight division specifically. Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciano, Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson. These are just some of the names that come to the everyday mind when boxing is brought up. They were the people's champion in their days. But what about the lesser known champions? The men who were forced into being bridging champions? Placeholders for the so-called icon. Today is all about those heroes. The heroes without a cape. Here's a brief history of heavyweight boxing's known shadow champions beginning, in my opinion, at the era of Jack Dempsey. Jack Dempsey was cut from a different cloth. The man was atop the world and seen as the most brutal and savage warrior the ring had ever seen. Light heavyweight marvel Gene Tunney openly campaigned for a title bout against Dempsey and wasn't taken seriously. He was the complete opposite of the reigning heavyweight champion, being a thinker who analyzed his opponents while utilizing movement, footwork, a high volume jab, and counter punching. However, it would be wrong to characterize him as an outside boxer. Tunney demonstrated his ability to hammer away at the body toe to toe against Harry Greb before refining his style after a loss the only loss of his career. Despite this, the American boxing public proved to have short-term memory, as Tunney's new style disappointed them, especially when he toppled the living legend, Jack Dempsey, twice. The boxing public refused to accept the fighting Marine. He was too bookish, or rather, too invested in scholarly interests, when he was supposed to be the face of the Hurt Business. He was too private and didn't allow the press to know the wonders of his life outside of the ring. He had dethroned the Manasseh Mauler, the people's champion, who was at the peak of his powers and who had come from nothing to topple the boxing world. Making the resentment worse was Dempsey's open admission that he didn't think he could have ever beaten Tunney. The man was just too perfect in the eyes of fans. Good student, good soldier, good pugilist, businessman, married into a wealthy family, dined with the elite. Gene Tunney was a model man at the very worst time to be so, as the Great Depression loomed. He retired undefeated at the heavyweight rank as champion, having never been knocked out and was the first ever ring fighter of the year in 1928. Criminally overlooked and our first hero without a cape who I failed to give his flowers in my 1970s retrospective on the day of his death. And yes, I know I said that already in the 1990s retrospective. The only mark on his legacy is that he never faced any of the legitimate black contenders of his time. For 12 years, Joe Lewis enforced his will on the heavyweight division, beating every man he faced. His reputation is a true American hero, even in times of heavy racism and segregation, had transcended him beyond the sport. 27 title defenses and retired on top in 1949. However, before his retirement, Lewis faced off against the unorthodox Jersey Joe Walcott in 1947. Walcott was widely believed to have beaten Lewis, having dropped the champion twice along the way to losing the decision. There began the shadow specifically over Jersey Joe. They would rematch in 1948, and Joe was KO'd by the Brown Bomber, banishing his chances of taking the reins from Lewis who would retire the following year. 
Our next entrant is tied to the hip with Walcott because of their timing together after Joe Lewis. Following Lewis's retirement, heavyweight vacancy would be decided between former Lewis challenger Jersey Joe Walcott and weight class leaper Ezra Charles. Charles would outpoint Walcott over 15 rounds to become champion, but remained in the shadow of Lewis's incredible reign. Even after becoming the first to outbox and outwit Lewis in 1950 when Lewis returned, Charles was thought to be a lesser champion because he lacked power and was too careful. In reality, he was an underrated master boxer who echoed the technical prowess of Gene Tunney before him, and contemporaries like Sugar Ray Robinson recognized this. Even stranger was the fact that Charles had cast a further shadow on Jersey Joe. After losing another decision to Charles, Walcott finally secured the title against rival Charles with a legendary walk-in knockout of the champion, where he became the oldest heavyweight champion in history up until that point at the age of 37. Walcott would beat Charles again via decision before defending his title against the true successor to Lewis in the eyes of the boxing public, Rocky Marciano. Marciano's style was very fan-friendly, as he went to war with every man he faced and outdogged them. He was a humble class act outside of the ring as well. Walcott ensured the world that he would beat Rocky, and was delivering on his promise, having become the first man to drop Marciano while leading on the scorecards. He was decked by what may be the hardest punch of all time, in the 13th round as The Rock beat him to the punch in an exchange of the right hands. Jersey Joe was out cold, and the new people's champion had finally arrived. They rematched in 1953, and the Brockton blockbuster floored Walcott in the first round in what would be Walcott's last fight. Jersey Joe left his mark on the sweet science by refusing to give up on his dreams of becoming heavyweight champion and achieving said goal on his fifth attempt, becoming a then-historical 37-year-old champ. Meanwhile, Ezra Charles would go on to challenge Marciano. In their first bout in 1954, Charles became the only man to ever take the rock the distance in an all-time classic bout that saw Marciano win by decision. Some felt that Charles had earned the win, and a rematch would happen months later in which Marciano again defeated Charles, this time by a desperate eighth-round knockout after the Cincinnati Cobra had split Rocky's nose with a devastating blow. Charles left his capeless mark on the sport by being a pound-for-pound, underappreciated great who carried himself with grace. Unfortunately, as covered in my 1970s retrospective, Ezra Charles would die at the hands of Lou Gehrig's disease, but his legacy is eternal. When Rocky Marciano retired in 1956, a six-man tournament took place to crown his successor, of which he would win when he knocked out the old mongoose Archie Moore in five rounds, becoming the youngest heavyweight champion in history up until that point at the age of 21, and the first heavyweight champion who was also an Olympic gold medalist. So already, we have a very special decade with both the oldest and the youngest champions up to that point coming to prominence, not to mention the only, to this day, heavyweight champion to retire undefeated. And yet, despite this all, Patterson, like Walcott before him, remained in the shadow of the retired people's champion, Rocky Marciano. After becoming the youngest champion, Floyd also went on to become the first man to ever regain the heavyweight title from the man who'd beaten him for it, Ingemar Johansson. Patterson won the back and forth rematch by knockout and won the trilogy rubber match by knockout as well. 
Floyd Patterson was quiet and reserved, preferring to do his talking in the ring. He was, straight up, a good guy, a nice guy, a gentleman of boxing. And as we know, nice guys finish last. Floyd's reputation wasn't helped by his less than impressive resume of title defenses. Rather than engaging the top contenders in Cleveland, Big Cat Williams, Zora Foley, and Eddie Machen, Floyd was steered more toward fringe contenders by his manager, Custy Amato. Not any fault of his own, but he felt the sting of the public for it and wanted to prove himself. He pushed for a title defense in 1962 against the baddest contender of them all, the most ducked man, perhaps, in the history of the division. Looming ever deep in the division, dealing with the worst of all shadows, and blacklisted from the main event was the big bear, Sonny Liston. Liston's association with the mob was well known and he was subsequently iced out of the title picture for the duration of the 1950s. President John F. Kennedy even insisted that Liston never be granted a title shot. Floyd Patterson was the one to finally insist Liston be treated as a man with good in him. It was this title defense that finally won Patterson the boxing public, or rather forced them behind him as Sonny Liston was seen as the evil to Floyd's good. Liston would go on to decimate Patterson for the title in the first round and do the same in the rematch. Immediately, Floyd lost the support of the public and went into a depression that he would recover from. A dark cloud had enveloped the world of boxing, according to the public, and Sonny Liston was denied any sort of love and recognition sad, considering it's all he wanted. He would get a speck of this backing from the public when he defended the title against a young, loudmouth dancing machine who found every way to make the public hate him. Cassius Clay would, against every odd in the book, go on to outbox Liston and make him quit on his stool in 1964. Clay announced himself a black Muslim and changed his name to Muhammad Ali before winning the rematch in 1965. He embarked on an undefeated stretch as champion before being stripped in 1967 and exiled from boxing for refusing to fight in the Vietnam War. Despite the public hatred for Ali, he was a massive draw who everyone wanted to see lose and didn't shy from voicing his opinions on racism that plagued America at the time. He had widespread support from the Nation of Islam and enjoyed his time at the top having no shadow to fight out of despite the conditions of his reign. In Ali's absence, Joe Frazier would unify the alphabet titles and stake his claim to the heavyweight lineage. Despite Ali's infamy, Frazier was forcibly seen as a false champion as Ali led a widespread campaign to ensure the world still knew he was the true heavyweight champion. When Ali returned from exile in 1970, the two would eventually agree to fight in 71. The fight of the century may be the greatest fight of all time and Frazier distinguished himself by scoring a decisive win over the Louisville Lip. The rest of the 70s would see Frazier lose to George Foreman in dominant fashion. Ali avenged the loss to Frazier and go on to regain the title from the invincible Foreman, and Frazier lose the trilogy to the greatest. After beating Foreman in 1974, Muhammad Ali became a mythical figure, his legacy self-sustaining, as he had broke through to finally become the people's champion. The shadow of his greatness extends even to the modern day as he helmed the golden age, the end of the dream match era before politics took over the sport big. It can be argued that every major heavyweight from the 70s lived in Ali's shadow, but Joe Frazier no doubt 
got the worst of it. For a more detailed overview of the 1970s heavyweight division, please watch my retrospective documentary linked below. Coming up is Ali's protege and learning everything as a sparring partner to the greatest. It was inevitable that Larry Holmes would forge his mark on the sweet science. When Ali retired to end the decade, his spot was wide open and Holmes appeared the heir apparent despite the public's refusal to let go of Muhammad Ali. The big black cloud beat out Ken Norton in 1978 for a portion of the title and would beat the best of the lost generation, the most we can ever ask of any champion, even beating a returning Ali in 1980 for the lineage. This dominant win over Ali solidified Larry as a villain in the eyes of the public and ensured that he would never be the people's champion. He would amass a 48-0 record helmed by 20 overall title defenses over seven years of non-stop dominance before being beaten by Michael Spinks in 1985. He would lose the 1986 rematch in controversy and further buried himself with his incredibly infamous comment. We really want to get technical about the whole thing. Rocky couldn't carry my jock strap. If I hurt your feelings back there, so fucking what? He went on hiatus, and in his absence, Kid Dynamite would come along to steal the hearts of the people. Mike Tyson's aggressive style and explosive knockout power ushered him in as the new people's champion, the impossible successor to Muhammad Ali. Holmes was now in the shadow of them both and challenged Tyson in 1988, to which he would be knocked out, the only time in his career, by Iron Mike. The Easton assassin remained criminally underrated, but would return in the 1990s and surprise the boxing world with a formidable stretch against the best of the most stacked era since the Golden Age. As mentioned, Iron Mike Tyson had taken the boxing world by storm. He became the youngest heavyweight champion in history in 1986 and unified the division by cleaning it right out. Not only did he secure the alphabet titles, but he ripped the lineage from Spinks and stopped Holmes, the two men who originally battled for supremacy. Coming into the 90s, Tyson was expected to continue his domination, all at the behest of the man who'd been gunning for him since unifying the cruiserweight division and moving up to heavyweight. Evander, the real deal Holyfield, wanted nothing more than to be the heavyweight champion of the world. He insists that Tyson was merely the one holding what he desired. The fight was prevented from happening many times specifically by Tyson's legal troubles. When Mike was imprisoned in 1992, Holyfield's then two-year reign was left in a suspension of illegitimacy in the eyes of the people. He'd beaten Buster Douglas, the man who dethroned Tyson. But this wasn't enough, as Douglas was seen as a fluke. He defended the title against two old men and a fringe contender in Burt Cooper. The two old men Foreman and Holmes were considered far past their best. It speaks to the depth of Evander's shadow when even Larry Holmes was cheered over him in a battle of the shadow champions. Evander's style was very fan friendly, but not to the nuclear proportion that was Mike Tyson's. Holyfield wasn't even responsible for the Tyson fights never coming to fruition. It was Mike. Yet still, the public treated him as if he were the one responsible. Holyfield ran into Riddick, Big Daddy Bo, at the end of 1992 and was beaten in the fight that finally earned him the love and respect of the public, 
as the warrior that he was. It was a war of epic proportions that earned both men honor. Bo would go on to become the people's champion in his own right, as Holyfield remained in Tyson's shadow. Bo's shadow over the division didn't haunt Holyfield, but rather attached itself to Riddick's Olympic rival, the man who'd vanquished Bo in controversy at the 1988 Super Heavyweight Olympic Finals. Riddick, Big Daddy Bo, in a publicity stunt, dumped the WBC title instead of fighting his mandatory Lennox, the Lion, Lewis. Lewis was awarded the title, becoming the first British world champion in almost a century, but was given no respect by the public. He defended the title until losing it in a shocker to Oliver McCall, a loss that cost us the long sought out super fight against Riddick Bowe, who himself had been dethroned by Evander Holyfield. Lennox rebounded under Emmanuel Stewart while Bowe fizzled out. Mike Tyson would make his return to boxing in 1995 and go on to win both the WBC and WBA titles in similar style to his dominance in the 1980s. Lewis was paid step-aside money in regards to a WBC title bout with Tyson, and Mike's camp eventually vacated the title to pursue the long-desired super fight with Evander Holyfield. Holyfield, seen as washed up after his career had spiraled since losing to Michael Moore and Riddick Bowe in their trilogy bout, shocked the world when he stopped Tyson in 11 rounds becoming the only other three-time world champion alongside Muhammad Ali. Lewis watched from the sidelines, battling his way back into prominence. He would unify the division in 1999 by beating Holyfield. Still, he sought to beat the man that the people remained attached to. He would do just that in 2002 when he knocked out Mike Tyson proving himself the undisputed best fighter of the 90s and his era as a whole. Despite this, he's criticized to this day for fighting the best when they were past their best. An unfair narrative considering Lewis shouldn't be punished for being the one who was ducked and for aging like fine wine. He would retire after defending his title against Vitaly Klitschko in the very controversial TKO6 in which Vitaly was getting the better of Lennox before the fight was stopped on cut. Lewis was a special case in that he was in the shadow of Bo, Tyson, and even Holyfield to an extent, despite being the best of them all. For a more in-depth look at the 1990s, Check out my retrospective of the decade, linked below. After Lennox Lewis retired, the Klitsch Bros would go on to dominate the division, gathering every major title between themselves. They never fought for obvious reasons. Ladd was a quiet champion, like Patterson and Holyfield, who did his talking in the ring. He was seen as boring, and as the death of the division. Despite this criticism, Vladimir amassed 19 title defenses over 10 years, beating every man who dared challenge him. Vitaly won the WBC title in 2004, was forced to retire due to a leg injury, and returned to reclaim the title immediately, holding it until his true retirement in 2013. While Vitaly never lost his title, Vlad was dethroned by the modern-day reincarnation of Muhammad Ali, it seems. The Gypsy King Tyson Fury's master class over Vladimir isn't to be overlooked as he dethroned the decade-long super champion with apparent ease. He seemed well on his way to being the people's champion as he was charismatic and a masterful boxer 
in the aftermath of the so-called boring Klitschko era. Personal problems would come to Durrell Fury and force him out of the sport before he could rematch Platt. He would overcome himself and return to the sport of which the landscape had changed. Vlad had lost his bid for the titles against the rising Anthony Joshua and retired thereafter. Deontay Wilder had staked a dominant claim to the WBC title and amassed 10 defenses. It was a strange time in which all three titans evoked a shadow on one another. Fury was still the lineal champion who dethroned Vlad. Joshua had beaten an arguably better version of Vlad perhaps more definitively, by knockout. Wilder had knocked out every man he faced, and fans awaited he and Joshua to fight for unification. Fury announced he would be challenging Wilder, and the two would go on to have a stellar, action-packed trilogy in which many feel Fury won all three fights. It was during this trilogy, specifically the second fight, that Fury asserted himself as the best, vanquishing any shadow that may have been over him. Fans who have waited for the unification bout with Joshua were stunned when Alexander Usyk dethroned AJ earlier this year. Their rematch is on the horizon and hopefully the winner fights Fury for unification. Despite this, the current people's champion is the only man who has held every major title in the division today. He's made it clear that the belts are irrelevant and that he wants the big fights. The shadow of Tyson Fury currently reigns supreme over the heavyweight division and conscious. Who will be the one to break free and cast their own shadow? All we can do is wait to see. Tyson Fury is a very special case. Despite his accomplishments, he was thrusted into the shadows and then he burst out and cast his own massive shadow, his 6'9 shadow, over Boxer. Long live the king and stay frosty, everyone. Thank you. This has been The Charles Jackson. I'll see you next time.